There is this idea on social media, at least in some circles, that women don't need zone two. Yes. So what you're saying is you would like someone to prioritize HIT if they don't have a lot of time for cardio, mm -hmm. but you're not saying that women should completely disregard zone two. So there's benefit to training at these different intensities, yes. steady state and then a, a higher intensity. Yes. And then I'll get you to kind of expand on that. Mm -hmm. And then I want to come back earlier. You said true HIT. So yes, I think, there's I, think I needed to find that. There's, a, I know. there's a, a few different ideas of what HIT training mm -hmm. is. So perhaps we first yeah. double click on zone two. Yes. So I think a better way of phrasing this is not that women don't need zone two or zone two is bad for us. It's that we need to be making sure that we're including and in prioritizing and getting in high intensity or sprint interval training as well. That's important for us to get in, but it doesn't mean that zone two is bad. We also have data. I mean, this is like my bias because my dissertation essentially showed this that like, you know, and other things show this that you know, training status affects fat oxidation in females as well. It's not like you just wake up and you have this max fat capacity, you're super metabolically flexible, you're super healthy just because you were born with est like estrogen being your predominant <laughs> cell signal with your hormones. It's There is a training stimulus to that. I actually, this is something I would love to research is like the interaction of exercise because there's estrogen receptors in the muscle and how that activates or, you know, potentiates or turns on, so to speak, these benefits and adaptations we get. Um, and so it's we. Ha if you are a female, you have to do aerobic training to improve your fat oxidation and your aerobic capacity just like everyone else. You don't just wake up to that. But you kind of are a little bit better at using fat for fuel or being oxidative by, by nature, right? So that's where that comes into. But you still need that training stimulus to refine that or maximize that or develop that aerobic capacity. High intensity interval training and sprint interval training is fantastic, but you can only do so much of it at a high quality. And you don't need a ton of it to get some of the results and benefits. But what happens with high intensity training and easy training is they both work through different pathways to kind of stimulate that mitochondrial biogenesis and the improved utilization of lipid and glucose when we're at at rest and in response to meals or in general during exercise. And they work through two different mechanisms. So either high volume, low power output, high power output, low volume. And they work through these different mechanisms, but essentially you, you're limited on how much of this high intensity stuff that you can do and recover from in a, in a given week and do of high quality. And so what you can do though, to continue to drive your aerobic adaptations is you can do a lot of volume of the easy stuff and move that and move that needle forward. And they they work similarly but different in how they stimulate these these pathways and refine them. And so you can't, I like I think with like the exercise guidelines as a minimum of what people should do, it's 150 minutes of moderate intensity per week or 75 minutes of vigorous. And it's essentially trading off two for one. And I think that's fine from a bare minimum health perspective, but I do not think a minute of high intensity exercise is the same as a minute of like easy exercise. I think that they are unique in what they each do. So I think if you walk three miles, it's not the same stimulus as if you run three miles, so to speak. I think that you're getting unique and different adaptations and you need the intensity. You want that high end effort stuff, but you just can't do a lot of it. So females might want or need or benefit more of that because they might need to develop the characteristics of their type two muscle fibers a little bit more because of those sectus differences. So it's potentially like, hey, maybe the distribution of what you're doing is shifted a little bit more for females so that you can get more of that adaptation or that gain. But that's where weekly volume comes in to play, where zone two training for somebody who's starting to do four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 hours a week or more of cardio is going to start to become a good bit of your cardio training. You can't just keep doing more and more hit sessions every single day. You're probably going to get in one to three high quality hit or sprint interval training sessions a week if you're only doing like maybe two or three days of cardio and you're sit sitting in that like minimum exercise guideline range getting to like 75 minutes total. But as you start to increase that volume of what you're doing, that's when you're going to start to distribute that more to zone two. And that, and, and, and women aren't not going to benefit from that. I mean, I'm biased, but I do a metric crap ton of zone two training. And I can tell you right now that my, everything that's supposed to adapt when you adapt to training adapts, but even with like adding in a little bit of that high intensity stuff, a little goes a long way and you can get a lot of benefits from it. You just have to make sure you don't remove that entirely or you still keep that in your training or for the busy regular person who's not doing a ton of training, maybe they're doing two high intensity days a week and one easy day per week, or they're doing 
you know, their one to three high intensity days and then whatever general other activities that they love to do outside of the gym, outside of that, and just including that within their training program and not thinking it of as either or, but hey, this is something that I should do and I need, but the rest of that's okay too. I had a whole episode on zone two with Inigo San Milan. His uh, paper with George Brooks on metabolic flexibility and lactate actually was what inspired my dissertation study, actually. So um, I haven't listened to that episode, but I saw some of the clips. But yeah, he is uh, he actually works at CU in, yeah. in, in, in the endocrinology yeah. department. I've never overlapped with him, but his uh, his paper on metabolic flexibility actually like inspired my entire dissertation. So mm-hmm. yeah. Well, the, the cliff notes from yeah. that episode, at least from his perspective, I guess the shorthand way of knowing that you're in zone two, which could be helpful for someone, is... Uh, you're a bit puffy, you can still talk uh, a little bit, probably can breathe through your nose, but not everyone can. Um, And then he seemed to think that once you start to go sort of out of zone two, above zone two, it becomes much harder to to have a conversation. Yeah, it's because it's essentially marked at that first ventilatory threshold. And so that's, that's like, like the talk test is one of the easy, because everyone gets so frustrated with the heart rate. And like a lot of that heart rate being low in zone two comes from that easy aerobic training, right? Like you still need that to kind of really get to that. But yeah, that talk test is super easy because it's like, like I ran, I ran yesterday and I talked to my brother the entire time on the phone and he's like, what are you doing right now? And I, I was like, I'm running. And he's like, I had no idea that you're running. And that's why I love telling people, I'm like, can you have a conversation? Like, can you talk to, like, I call my mom all the time and talk to her while I'm That's running. impressive because I, I know that running takes throws a lot of people out of zone two. It does because it's three. and that's part of that comes to from like it is a little bit more excitatory for the central nervous system. I think zone two for a lot of people, I think honestly, rec- harder recommendations for people who are listening to this, female or otherwise, if you don't like to run, one, it's a lot easier to stay in zone two um on a bike or an erg or a rower. And same thing will define hit here in a second. It's a lot easier to do true hit on like an, a, an erg or a machine that you're like locked into so you can go at that full power output. Because if like running's a skill and sprinting's a skill, like I think doing actual sprints of some degree are great to do. But running is a skill and like I don't think people should just like start sprinting on a run if they haven't been running at all because if you want to, you know, you want to develop the, the adaptations to your connective tissue within that. But it's easier to get on a bike and push all out on that because it's a little bit more locked in and it's not as much skill demand as like a rower maybe or even a skier. And so I like the bike's a really good option for that because one, you stay in zone two easier or two, you can reach a higher power output or effort on the high intensity stuff with less like. You want the limiting, the limiting aspect is your cardiovascular system, not some type of mobility or skill issue. Yeah, like if you're not, I mean, but the same thing for like my, my running clients, they're like, wait a second, my speed work is basically high intensity interval training. I'm like, yeah, that's essentially, you're just you're just training specific and different energy systems to tolerate different speeds and intensities, but you're a runner, so you're practicing that, doing the thing that you're trying to do because you want, it's kind of like the, the, the skill of doing a high rep max lift effort. It's very neuromuscular and same with fast running. You have to practice that. But if you don't care about that, or you can't do that very well, yeah, remove the limiter. Go like I think the bike is probably the 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 best piece of cardio equipment. And like if you can, even an air bike is great because that's just like a full body crusher for a lot of people and that really spikes. Because running sometimes gives more of that cardiovascular stimulus too, because it is very whole body and very stressful versus like maybe like a, a seated bike. But like an air bike, I think is like one of like, probably the most evil but best forms of like localized locked in easy to use cardio equipment for a lot of people and if you don't have that you use what you have available to you but yeah run us through a before we kind of land the plane here yeah this episode has actually turned into a marathon i know sorry i've made an ultra marathon out of it <laughs> i have a lot of knowledge very in this fitting. little tiny very, head. Very i know i turned it into an ultra sorry uh i need no, some I more love carbs it. i love it ask a question and just let you go yeah uh okay what is a true hit protocol what does that look like so if i'm going to do one or two hit sessions a week according to the evidence the way that we want to be doing that to get the best bang for our buck Mm -hmm. how are we approaching this yes and so people think hit is like your group fitness circuit class or high intensity boot camp type things and i'm at the point where like if the terminology that the lay public uses i'm like that's fine because that's what you recognize it as but when we think about like true hit and what we see in the evidence of what's beneficial or studied for these specific benefits we're looking at. We are looking at 
exercise training sessions, and I should also preface this, when I say HIT, I also mean the inclusion of sprint interval training, because sprint interval training is just a subset of high intensity interval training. Um, it's just a shorter form of it. So on the lower end of the spectrum of the more sprint interval training, you're looking at maybe four to six rounds of 20 to 30 second all out effort sprinting, like max power output as hard as you can. You're technically probably going at an effort higher than your VO2 max or your power output at VO2 max. You um, say sprinting, that can be on a bike, it could be, bike on a could rower, be running, running, it could be rowing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just your max effort of what you can do. And then you're fully resting and recovering probably at least 90 seconds, but maybe two to five minutes upwards of that. It's kind of like very similar to strength training in nature. You're doing this very short, high, like. 20 to 30 second, mm -hmm. all out burst. Yeah. 90 seconds to five minute rest. Yes. Repeating four to six rounds. Yes. Yeah. And that's, that's. That's sprint training. Yeah. And that's when you're doing that at like your max your max effort, like you really need to recover because that's using a lot of phosphocreatine, just like lifting is. It's really depleting and it takes about two to five minutes to replenish the, the phosphocreatine system, which is why that kind of rests there. Um, and so you're, when you're doing those short intervals, you're really trying to like go all out. Like you should feel like you need, like you can't breathe when you're done because you're going to have this recovery response. Eight out constantly. of 10, nine out of 10, 10 out like, of 10. This is like nine to 10 out of 10 effort. So the shorter the effort, the shorter the duration, the higher that effort and intensity is going to be. And then you get into more hit hit training, which is going to be maybe like one minute to four minutes on. And then the rest ratio is something like half to two times the duration of it. So some of my favorite hit protocols to be more specific is like, I love the one minute on, one minute off. I think that's that. You're starting at five rounds and building up to 10 for a lot of people, I think is a great, easy workout, 10 to 20 minutes, you're in and out. You could also scale it or modify it for people who either want to go more intense in that one minute or potentially have lower fitness status and need more recovery and doing a minute and a half to two minute rest. And that's a great thing. If you're starting out and you are new to this or you have lower cardiovascular fitness, do less rounds and more rest when you're doing these because that will be a little bit easier for you. Or just start with the easy cardio and then work your way up to this. Um, and then you can go up to like two, three, or four minute bouts. And so those are going to start to be like the one minute might be like a seven to eight effort, maybe eight to nine, but you can't you can't go as intense, right, at the power output. So your power output is going to be slower at each of these. Right. Um, so your your effort, it's it's still gonna feel overall the max effort that you can do for that one minute, but your relative intensity of what you can do at like general speed and effort is gonna go down. And then you get like two, three, or four minutes, and then you're doing those resting for like two, three, or four minutes. And so my protocol I used in my dissertation was four minutes on, three minutes rest for four rounds. And that's really hard. It doesn't seem like it's anything special, but that's, you know, a little bit of harder, longer effort. So it's a little bit different of of the, the spectrum of that sprint training. What kind of RPE are you yeah. aiming for if you're doing that four-minute interval? Probably like I would say an eight. Yeah, I think so I. So you're actually you're think, up there, but you're not all out because if you're all out, you have and to, you're truly all out, yes. you're only going to last twenty or thirty seconds. And this is my advice with the repeated interval training: is you're only as good as your as your your slowest interval, and so you don't want to think about going all out in the first round and then not being able to repeat it. When you do these, you want to think about being able to repeat that effort over and over. You might dissipate a little bit with time. That's perfectly normal. That might be, the first one might be your highest effort and then you might slowly lower a little bit, but you shouldn't be like going at, I don't know, like maybe you're on an air bike and you're at 350 watts in your first round, but then you can only maintain 150 for the rest four. You, you, wanna, you wanna be able to make it repeatable and so you can sustain and keep doing that effort across time. And if you can't keep sustaining it and you're trying to do tons and tons of rounds, well, maybe then you're pulling back. Like if you're doing two rounds of four minutes, and then you're doing that until you adapt and acclimate to that. And then you're potentially doing three and then and then four over the time um, within these. And so those are come some of the protocols that are kind of established in the literature that people are using that I think are really great. But are they comparable or is, is, is sprint interval interval training superior to the the four minute intervals or the one minute on, one minute off? Yeah. So I think there's like a big thing right now. I think maybe not in the the women shouldn't do zone two side of things, maybe the more bro biohacky side of things, or everyone's like only zone two or only zone five. Like they've polarized to the point where they're like zone three and four are useless. And I, I'm not of, of that opinion. Um, I do like a polarized 
pyramidal mix, I guess you would say, in how I approach my cardio training. So polarized training is where you only do, you do the bulk of your training in zone two, and then you do a small bit in zone four or five. And then pyramidal is where you do a good bit of your training in zone two, but you do a little bit in zone three, four, and five. Less in zone three, but you still use a little bit of that. And so I think what, when we think about what the duration of these are doing, they're all targeting you know, different areas of our lactate threshold or our, our heart rate response or percentages of our VO2 max. And they're also targeting different energy systems or contributions of that, um, as well as potentially that power output. So I think sprint interval training and HIT are unique and that they, you know, the sprint interval training offers a little bit more of that max power output and that it's a little bit, you know, neuromuscular and in, in, in nature and you're, 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 you're training to sprint and go all out. And then with HIT, it's kind of like, for most people, if you're training at threshold or above threshold or whatever, it's it probably doesn't matter too much. It's more the fact that you're doing it that's eliciting these benefits. When it comes down to the nitty gritty, it's more like, okay, sports performance, what are we trying to target with the individuals or train? With my clients, like what I do, pretend, I give my clients four sprint or head interval trainings a month to do. So like one a week. And then they have other like types of cardio they can do on top of it if they're not running. And I usually like to do a mix and a distribution of like, okay, maybe this workout you're doing 20 to 30 30 second efforts, but this one you're doing three to four minute efforts. And then maybe this day you're doing 10 minutes max calories and you're recovering and then maybe doing a few short sprints. Like you can mix and blend these. And and I think it's important for people to train um, across the spectrum. I think there's benefit to kind of training across the durations of these spectrums. And usually my rule of thumb with people is like what you suck at maybe that's what you need to be doing more. Like I'm- What you dread. Yeah, like I'm <laughs> I'm a really good aerobic. Like I have a really good aerobic base, but like I really, really struggle with like, like high glycolytic activity. Like I can't recover that lactate at a high level of effort. And so for me, I know that that's something that I really struggle with, with those durations. Like I can sprint really hard and I can run for hours, but that like one to four minute effort, I really struggle with. So I know like, okay, like that's underdeveloped on me. So I should lean into that more because that's harder for me. But if you're just training for general health, I mean, I usually tell my clients, I'm like, I don't care if you cherry pick the cardio workouts, just do them. Like they're all going to be doing something for you. Most people aren't fit enough. I is usually my, my favorite thing to say to people, like you're not fit enough to worry about the details, but do a little bit of everything and you'll probably capture most of what you need or want across time. Um, But I do think when you think about it, putting it in the buckets of sprint interval training and the buckets of high intensity interval training is something that I think is good to maybe do one sprint effort a week or you do one effort a week or you're including some variation of both across time in your training. 